Last week we talked about pulling some weeds. Um, how many of you guys talked about that this week? About some weeds that you need to have pulled within your life. Um, today we're talking about the fruit that we gain if we pull some weeds. And the fruit is something that uh, we desire. Something that we have to have within our life. I'd like to give you some weeds that we have to pull. And then talk about the fruit that we gain if we pull some of those weeds. How many of us desire love within our life? We have to pull the weed of anger. What about joy? We have to pull some weeds of sorrow. What about peace? Sometimes we have to pull the weeds of anxiety and worry. What about long suffering? Maybe we have to talk about being impatient or vengeful. What about gentle? Sometimes we have to have the spirit of get rid of the heart of harshness, goodness, talk about immorality, faith, talk about distrust, meekness. Sometimes we have to pull the weed of pride or self control. Maybe we have to pull the weed of impulsiveness. See, there are weeds all over our life. And the weeds grow up without any work. And once we ignore the weeds within our life, we turn around and the flower bed of our life is full. And we work so hard at one time to pull those weeds and we go off and do something else and we come back, it seems like the very next day, and the weeds that we pulled are now full blown. And we say it's so hard to keep my life or my fruit going strong when it seems like all I do is pull weeds. But we have to have a desire for something or the weeds will grow up within our life. And let me tell you the nine characteristics of the fruit that we want within our life. And if you would memorize these nine words, you can't do these words, these characteristics within your life on your own. When we try to do these things, we live in the flesh and the weeds will grow up because we can't fulfill these without Christ. In Galatians chapter 5 it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine flavors, nine fruit, if you would, that come to our life. Against such there is no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, in step with the Spirit. Let us walk within the Spirit. Let us be in step with Him. How do we do that? Well, we, we look at Galatians chapter 5, and then I want to go down to John chapter 15. And you have to remember, this is the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. This is the night that Jesus is talking to His disciples before He's crucified for the very last time. And these guys are scared. Jesus just told them that I am going to be crucified. I'm going to be put to death and I will come again. But these disciples are scared to death. They have no idea what's going to take place. They don't look into the future and they are fearful. And Jesus wanted to give them some hope. He wanted to give them some hope. If you ever remember the, the movie Crimson Tide, the, the submarine movie, where, uh, what's his name, John Hackman? and Denzel Washington. One was the, the chief and one was the first officer. And, and uh, uh, he wanted to, to, to deploy a, a, a missile. And Denzel said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. We don't have all the picture of it. And, and they w went at each other and they had a little uh, a fight with on the submarine. But here's what the key is to have a submarine missile launch. The chief and the first officer both have their keys. And they both have to insert their keys and turn the key at the same time in order to unlock the missile. Well, that's exactly what Galatians chapter 5 and John chapter 15 have to say. Galatians chapter 5 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. John chapter 15 tells us how to live by the Spirit. And it says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself 
unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. You can't bear fruit on your own. You can't look at fruit and say, I want to be an orange. I want to have joy. I want to have peace. I want to have long suffering, but I'm going to do it on my own. It'd be like this apple representing joy, and I have joy within my life. I'm happy. Everything's going wonderful, and you're having a miserable day. So, Jonathan, have some joy. Good catch, man. Good catch. <laughs> Just because I have joy, I cannot give you joy because I'm in the vine, but you are not. I can give you my life. I can help with you. But you cannot have what I have. You have to have it in your own life. I may be in the vine. I may be attached to Christ. I may have the joy, the fruit, the love of Christ. But I can't give it to you. The only way that you can have the fruit of the Spirit is not because you're beside somebody that has it. I can't give it to you. But you can have it when you abide in the vine. That's the only way that we can have it when we abide in Christ. But the fruit is very difficult. It's very difficult because we can't just have what we want. We don't just grow fruit of the Spirit. So I want to give to you a few points of talking about how to abide in the vine. How to look at what Christ wants to do within our life. The first is, fruit is proof of my relationship with Christ. Fruit is proof of my relationship with Christ. I'm going to pick on somebody else other than Jonathan because he can't catch for the lick, okay? <laughs> Nowadays, when you buy fruit, there's an inspection label on the fruit, which means someplace between Florida or California or wherever it was grown in here, somebody looked at this fruit, inspected this fruit, and they verified that this fruit is good. It's a good fruit. It's an apple. It's a good fruit. But somebody inspected it. And that's the same thing that Christ does for us. When we buy fruit, we look at it and we can see it's inspected and we say it's okay. You know, the Bible says the same thing within our life. When we bear fruit, it tells others and it tells myself that I have been inspected and I am a follower of Christ because I have fruit within my life. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, it says this. You will know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or bushes from figs? No. What we do is we gain what we are. If I look at an apple tree and I see oranges on the apple tree, that doesn't make sense. But if I look at a tree and it's bearing apples, I know automatically it's an apple tree. If I look at an orange tree and I see oranges coming from the orange tree, I know it's an orange tree. When we were in Cuba just a few years ago, I, I, it was awesome to see all these banana trees. And we reached out, and I love bananas. We reached out, and we were eating bananas right off the tree because we knew that the banana tree produced bananas. And whatever we are, we produce. And if we are in Christ, we will be able to produce who God wants us to be. And I love what that verse says. You will know them by their fruits. That's why Galatians chapter 5 calls the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. It is the evidence of the Holy Spirit within our life. Now, let me get serious for a second. There's sometimes we say, I don't see any fruit within my life. I don't see any evidence of God working in my life. I don't have joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and goodness, and self-control. What does that mean? I think sometimes that means we work so hard at trying to produce fruit, we don't abide in Christ so he can give us that fruit. Now, how do, I, how do I do that? Well, I think when it says abide in me, it means be attached to Christ. John chapter 15, verse 8, it says this. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be called my disciples. It is Christ's desire that we bear fruit. How do we bear fruit? You can't bear fruit on your own. It says, without me, you can do nothing. So the only way that we as children of God can bear fruit is if we abide in Christ. How do we abide in Christ? 
That's why the Bible has given to us. That's why when we just read five minutes to ten minutes a day of the Word of God, that's why singing songs and listening to music, putting our focus and our life in Christ's hands, that is what we can do to bear fruit. Sometimes we look at expressions of fruit in many different ways. We say that, say that as long as I is go to church, I'm producing fruit. And you know, you can go to church all day long and not produce fruit. You can, you can sing songs all day long and not produce fruit. You can give all the money you want to the church and not produce fruit. Producing fruit means this. I want Christ to be the center of my life. I want him to be whatever he wants me to be. Even in the very first chapter of the Bible, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to produce other things. When we want to produce what God wants us to do, he wants us to reproduce ourselves in others. Reproduction. Spiritual reproduction. That means share your faith. Share your life. Share your story when people that are needing it. So often, our sharing our story is inviting them to church. Come to church. Come to church. Come to church. Which is good. But sharing your story from you to somebody that you have a sphere of influence with changes the story. Because they love you. And they know you. And what we have to do is to be fruitful, is to be able to share our story. And when we share our story, what happens is we are trusting in God. We're saying, Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, I need your help. When we are fruitful, it says, God gives us an opportunity to share our faith. So the virtue sometimes is, am I willing to go out on the limb? Am I willing to talk to somebody? Am I willing to pray for somebody? And then after the reproduction of our spiritual life, sometimes the fruit is just the evidence of what Christ wants to do within our life. He wants to give you joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance and self-control. He desires that. He desires us to have calmness within our life instead of the fear and anxieties within our life. Fruit, simply as put outward, is the expression of our inner nature. What happens outside what happens in our life? When you see somebody that you feel like has it all together and they, they feel like they have joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance and you look at them, they say they have it. They have it together. They didn't get there on their own. They didn't, they didn't automatically go stare at, a, at an orange tree. They're 40 years old and I'm going to stare at this orange tree and all of a sudden, instantaneously, an orange pops out. An orange grows. It doesn't instantaneously happen. And we can pray all day long for patience and kindness and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness, but just because you pray for it doesn't mean the next morning you're going to wake up and, ha, ha, everything's wonderful. It grows. It's a daily exhibition of love. It's abiding in Christ. We may say, I want to do this, and I want this, and I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. It's the fruit of the Spirit it's loving, praying, abiding in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, he can take care of great things. Now let me tell you about this story here. One of the largest and oldest grapevines in the world uh, is outside of the city of London. It's called the Great Vine of Hampton Court Palace. And it's planted in 1768. And some of the branches are over 200 feet long. The main trunk is 12 feet in diameter. And it produces over 800 pounds of delicious grapes every year. And you would look at that and you'd say, wow, what a beautiful, gigantic grape vine that would be. But every year, the vine dresser or the husbandman would go in and he would prune those branches. Instead of being 400 feet long and produce 1,600 pounds of grapes, they cut it back. And they produce better grape because they prune the branches back. But here's what they do. It's the same thing what the Bible says that God would do for us. Every, every year they go back and they look at the branch on this 12-foot trunk of this vine. And whenever there's a branch that does not produce grape but produces leaves, it is not productive. And they trim the branch that does not produce grapes. They cut it off. Because the branch 
that does not produce grapes is taking the nourishment from the vine that does produce grapes. So they have to branch it off. And I, and I was reading that story, so I thought, what does that look like at the church? I believe there's a lot of times we are believers in Christ, but we do not produce fruit. Sometimes we're saying, what do I need to do? And sometimes Christians produce fruit, and sometimes religion produces branches. And the Bible says we shall know them by their fruits. So as a Bible-believing church, what I'm saying is we must have fruit. And if we can look at our life and we are not producing fruit, I may say this, you may be religious, but you're not abiding in Christ. And if we are not fruitful, what we're saying is I need to be focused on what Christ wants within my life. The Bible says it's God's desire for every disciple to produce fruit. It's not God's desire for you to come to church it's not God's desire for you to be happy. It's God's desire for every disciple to be fruitful. How do we do that? Is sometimes we have to allow God to prune us. Sometimes that's hard. The second thing is I can't produce fruit. I only bear the fruit that Jesus produces. I can't bear fruit myself. I can't produce fruit. There's a difference between producing fruit and bearing fruit. Think about it. A branch just shows off. A, 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 a grape is on the branch, and the branch doesn't say, look at what I'm doing. The branch itself can do nothing except for abide in the vine. What we have to do is we have to understand, in John chapter 15, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit on itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The bottom line, abiding means to be in to be attached to, to be focused on. There's, there's no way, you don't see factories producing fruit. You don't go to a factory and say, I want you to produce an apple. Now, factories may can, they can produce other things to go with it, but a factory cannot produce an apple. That's God's work can produce an apple. We cannot produce fruit within our life. Only God can produce the fruit within our life. When we do that, God can work within our life. The fruit is coming from God. All we have to do is we have to attach ourselves to God. Now, there's an old uh, story about a, a, um, a village up in Nepal. And the village up in Nepal didn't have any electricity, and it was, didn't have any running water, and they, they, they didn't really have anything, and they were a poor, poor country, and, and uh, they did farming for a living, and they just traded goods that they produced. Well, one day they, they took all the grain that they produced and they went down and they went to the city to sell the grain. So the man went down to the city to sell the grain and he went in and for the very first time in his life, he saw lights. And he saw in the middle of the night that they could see and he goes, he goes what, what is this? And they said, this is light. And he said, how, 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 do, how do I get these light bulbs? They said, well, you go into the store and you give them money and they give you light bulbs. He goes, well, how do you turn the light on? He said, you walk over to the switch and you flip the switch. He said, cool, I want some light bulbs and I want a switch. So he went in and he bought five light bulbs and he went and bought a switch. And he walked up back to his Nepal village and he, he was all excited. He goes, he goes, guys, wait till you see what I bought. He said, what, what is it? He said, just wait till nighttime. Wait till nighttime. So he went into his house and he put his light bulbs up and he even put the switch on the door. And there's a bunch of villagers outside of his house and they were waiting till nighttime. And he walked out and he says, guys, you've never seen this before. Wait. So he walked over to his door and he flipped the switch. And guess what happened? Nothing. How come? It's not attached to anything. If you don't have electricity, you're not going to have light. If you don't have Christ, you're not going to have fruit. And sometimes we act like we can put our light bulbs up. We can act like we want to flip a switch. But if we're not attached to the power, it will never work. We can fake our fruit. We can act like we have fruit. But until we actually attach ourselves to the power, we're just playing the game of Christianity. So the third point. Branches that are pruned produces more fruit. Whew. 
This is a tough one. Because we don't like being pruned, do we? You may say, man, I've got this thing covered. But there's three levels of faithfulness in our pruning. He speaks of bearing fruit. And then he mentions bearing much fruit. And we're, we're, we'd be happy right there. I, I, I'm bearing much fruit. It'd be like you have in your life and everything's going great and, and your life is good and your kids are doing good and, and your spiritual life is good and you're reproducing yourself and you're saying, I've got everything under control and look how wonderful everything is. And all of a sudden, the gardener comes into your life and you're thinking he's going to give you a trophy, a, a ribbon. He says, you are doing wonderful. But he brings out the shears and he starts cutting on your vine. And you're saying, oh, I, I like that part of my life. I, I don't want you to cut there. And he says to us, you are bearing fruit. But I want you to bear more fruit. I am faithful to you, and you're abiding in me. And I know this is painful, but if you allow me to prune this in a season, this will produce much more fruit than you've ever had in your life. Now, in our life, I'm happy with the fruit I'm producing. because We don't know what more fruit would look like, but God does know what more fruit would look like. So we say, I don't want to be pruned. I don't want to go through that pain. But once he has pruned us, and the next season comes, and we see the fruit that God has produced within our life because he has pruned us, he has cut us, he has allowed us to grow, and more fruit produced within our life is his glory, not our glory. We can't be a, fr uh, a branch and cut off the vine and throw it on the ground and say, produce fruit next year, because that branch would just wither away and die. But as long as that branch is attached to the vine, it has the opportunity. But there's a third level that he has more fruit. That more fruit is the top level. That more fruit is what we desire. We want to have fruit, even much fruit. But he says, even after you have much fruit, I want to have a smile on my face. And he says this, I want to cut what you've done off. And I want to give to you, I want to graft into your life something that's bearing more fruit. There's levels that we can't understand. But he says this in John chapter 15, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it bears more fruit. And here's, I love this about Christianity. When we are faithful, when God blesses us and he allows us to experience things and minister to others and we bear fruit, what he says is, I trusted you here. I'm going to give to you this I've trusted you and you bear fruit when it was simple. You abided in me and, and I in you and now I see that you're faithful to what I have given to you. Now I'm going to prune you. I'm going to give you more fruit. And if you abide in me, what you could produce for me is unbelievable. I want to give to you more fruit. But sometimes that pruning process hurts. Pruning is painful. When the Lord starts pruning our lives, we want to say, no, Lord, I don't want to go through that. That hurts. I don't want. But once the pruning process is over and we look back upon our life and we say, because of the pruning process, God gave to me this. Or God is allowing me to have this. It changes everything. Now, you can look at your own personal life. In times that God said to you, I want to make you better. I want to make you stronger. I know that you're not going to understand everything that's taking place within your life. I understand my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I know that you want to be happy. But God wants to make you holy. God wants to use the situations within your life to make you produce fruit. And sometimes it takes pain. Sometimes even scars within our life. And when we look at the scars and the pains within our life, while we're going through the pruning process, we are hating it. But when we look back five to ten years after that pruning process is over, 
we would say, wow, God allowed me to go through this pain to experience the joys I'm having now. Somebody asked me this question this week. What is the most popular song that usually is sung at uh, weddings for a second or a third wedding? And I thought for a little bit, and I thought, um, what's the saying? Broken Roads? Is that the name of the song? Um, they told me what it was. I didn't know what it was. And that all the roads that I've gone through, all the roads that I've been on, all the pain and all the heartache that I've gone through are here to bring me to you. And I believe sometimes within our life, we feel like the roller coaster ride that we are on is painful. But God uses every pain for his glory. God uses all the pruning to bring glory to him. Have you ever thought of a man in the Bible that uh, has gone through the pruning process? I think of the man by the name of Paul. And he went through the pruning process and everything that he did was to bring glory and honor to him. We think about our pruning process and we think about, God, I don't want you to do this and I don't want that to be cut out of my life. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this about Paul. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day. I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in the perils in the city, in the perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, weariness of toil, in sleepless often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides all these things, what comes to me daily in the deep concern for the churches. He was beaten, stoned, and everything he did, he says this at the end of his life, I have fought my fight. I have kept the faith. I'm looking forward to what lays ahead. Paul. A man that was pruned by God. He was giving fruit. Then he was giving much fruit. And then he gave more fruit. God allowed his life to be made right. My main responsibility is to remain firmly connected to Christ. To remain firmly connected in Christ. John chapter 15 verse 5 it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The King James, the word abide means to stay connected. To stay connected. Jesus uses this ten times to stay connected. Stay connected. Why is that so important? The disciples were about ready to watch Jesus be crucified. The disciples were about ready to scatter. The disciples were scared. And Jesus said, abide. Stay connected. You're going to be tempted to run. You're going to be tempted to go back to fish. You're going to be tempted to quit. Abide. Because if you abide in me, when everybody else is going to go away, when you're scared and you want to quit and you want to run and you don't even want to mention my name again, abide in me. Because if you do not abide in me upon yourself, you can do nothing. But if you stay within me, he said this, I am leaving, but I'm going to give to you someone, a person, an entity, part of the triune Godhead called the Holy Spirit. And if you abide in me, he can give to you the attributes of the Holy Spirit. This love, the joy, the peace, and the long-suffering, and the gentleness, kindness, faith, meekness, and self-control. That's what you can have. But if you don't abide in me, you're going to abide in the flesh, and in the flesh, you will run. In the flesh, you'll be scared. In the flesh, you will quit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. But with me, you can do everything. If you abide in me, Stay close to the branch. Allow the fruit of the Spirit to be produced within your life. You can do this thing. 
So imagine in your pruning process, apart from Christ, I can't have love. But with Christ, I can love. What, what does love look like? Love is, a, love is something that we do. It's not just a romantic type love. If you have love for somebody, you have empathy for them. You care for them. You show compassion to them. You treat them as somebody that is important to you. Joy, when the world is falling apart, when your life is in chaos, when everything around you falls apart, the inner joy is what God gives to us. That joy is saying, everything else is falling apart, but the Holy Spirit of God is working within my life, and I can have inner joy. That's something that's hard to have. That's something when everybody else is falling apart, but you can say, I'm trusting in God. I may lose my job. I may not have this tomorrow, but I know I have joy because it comes from Christ. But then you have peace. If you're abiding in the vine, you have peace. And we call that the peace that passeth all understanding. A lot of people go through this during very terrible times within their life. During funerals and during deaths. And everything is in chaos. And you're sitting by yourself and, and the whole world is moving on. And you want to yell and say, don't you know that I'm hurting? Don't you know my mom or my dad or my daughter or my son just passed away? Don't you care? That's what we want to say. But when we have inner peace, we can say, Lord, I need your help. And it gives to us peace, a, a contentment of knowing he's in charge. I'm not in charge. Without Christ, we have no peace. With Christ, abiding in him, we have all peace and long-suffering. Long-suffering. We think about that with our patience. The long-suffering, I believe, is so much more than just losing our temper and being impatient. When we're abiding in Christ and you're a disciple of His, that means you're praying for somebody. You're caring for them. And you're asking the Lord to give you an opportunity and maybe you witness to Him for 5, 10, 15 years and you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Long-suffering means grit. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue to pray for them. I'm going to continue to talk to them. I'm going to continue to love them. I'm going to continue to do everything I can to be the tool in which Christ can use. It's called long-suffering. I, I don't care what I go through. My goal is not for me to be happy. My goal is for me to produce fruit. And then gentle. A quiet and gentle spirit. When everybody else around you is fighting... When chaos is all around you. And you have the right to fight. And you probably should. Being gentle means, Lord, I'm going to abide in you. And when everybody else is falling apart, I'm going to stay gentle. I'm going to be calm. I'm going to let God to work within my life. A gentle spirit. And then kind. Without the abiding in Christ... I, I know that I'm just talking to myself, but there's days that I'm not very kind. There's days that I get up in the morning and, you know, I'm, I'm a morning person. I like getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get in my Bible for three or four hours and pray for every one of you by name and, you know, spend six or seven hours just being godly. But, you know, there's times that I get up and I'm not in a good mood. It takes me four cups of coffee just to smile. Give me an amen. But sometimes we need God to give us that graciousness of being kind when sometimes we don't feel very kind. Extend kindness when sometimes they are not very worthy of kindness. And then faith. Faith. What God has done for me, what God wants to do through me, when I abide in Christ, I can live in my faith. And what Christ can do through me is I have confidence, I have faith that He loves me and He wants to use me. And then meek. Jesus was very meek. That doesn't mean Jesus was weak. Meekness is power harnessed. It means I have the authority to do whatever I want to do. 
But just as Jesus, when we abide in Christ, I can put over my authority and put on meekness and love somebody as equal, even though I may have authority over them. Even though I have power, meekness is I'm going to harness my power and my authority and love you. And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then self-control. Self-control is what we read about last week. The fruit is choked down by the flesh and the weeds of our life. And sometimes the self-control means this. I want to do this in the flesh. But when we abide in Christ, he gives us the authority and the power to be under control. Under his control. When we are under his control, we're abiding in Christ. The things that we used to do, we don't do anymore because we're abiding in Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit is in our life. The weeds that we used to deal with when we abide in Christ, the weeds automatically go away because we are abiding in Christ. We're not living in the flesh. We're living in the Spirit. And he says, let us walk after the Spirit. But we cannot do this on our own. J.C. Ryle captured this idea when he said this. When Jesus said, abide in me, he meant, cling to me. Stick fast to me. Live your life in close and intimate communion with me. Cast your whole weight on me. Never let go your hold on me even for a minute. To remain in Christ means nothing else matters. I want God more than I want anything else. When you're thinking about what we can do and what Christ wants to do within our life, we think about starting fresh, starting over, abiding in Christ. Next week here at church, um, Pastor Al uh, came to my office just a few weeks ago and he said, he said, Bruce, I have an idea. I said, okay, what's the idea? He said, I want, I want a church alive Sunday. I, I said, tell me what a church alive Sunday is. He said, uh, we have people that need to get baptized. I said, yeah. He said, we have people that want to be baby dedicated. Yeah. We have people that want to join the church. Yeah. Why don't we do this in one Sunday? Church alive. Why don't we have the Lord's Supper? And you know, when we do the Lord's Supper, it's, it's not for a time frame. It's not a certain time. The Bible says, as often as you do, do this in remembrance of me, and here at Glenville, we do the Lord's Supper multiple times during the year. But when we do it, we want to make it special. Because it's something, it's a, it's a unique time of, of, of cleanliness towards God. We, we come and examine ourselves. We, we take the elements and, and we pray and we let God work within our life. So next Sunday, we're doing the church ordinances. We're going we're gonna to have baptisms going on. And after the baptisms, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And after the Lord's Supper, we're going to invite new people to join the church that have gone through classes, that have communicated to us that they want to join the church. And, and then the kids that haven't been dedicated back to God, we're going to talk about why we don't baptize babies and why it has to be their choice. And, and we can dedicate them, but we cannot baptize them because there's never a baby that was ever baptized in Scripture. We're going to do a church alive. And what that means is we're starting over. We want a fresh start. We want our church to be alive. We want our church to say, I want God to be glorified within my life. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. We can play the game of church all day long. But apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Could you imagine trying to juggle we can juggle balls, and you can juggle, and I can juggle maybe three balls. But what about juggling six balls? The world's record is 13 balls at one time. Could you imagine juggling 13 things at one time? What about nine? What about juggling love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, and self-control? I don't know if I could do that. I'm so busy juggling so busy, okay, I gotta be joyful. I gotta be patient. I gotta be kind. I gotta be self controlled. You think about that. You wake up and say, okay, it's mind boggling because I can't do those things. And that's what Jesus is saying in John chapter 15. You don't have to 
produce those nine things. You can't do it. He said, I want you to put into your hand one thing. And if you take this away, your life will change. He said this, all you have to do to have the fruit of the Spirit within your life every day is abide in me. Not produce fruit. I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be self No, 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 no. Abide in Christ. And if you abide in Christ, you remain in Christ, you hold on to Christ, all of these things will be evident within your life. The fruit of the Spirit is abiding in Christ. The vine is attached to the power. And the fruit of the Spirit can be evident within your life. Not instantaneously. It grows. It's going to be pruned. It's work. Abide in Christ. You're struggling. Abide in Christ. Your marriage is struggling. Abide in Christ. Look at the fruit of the Spirit and say, I want those fruit in my life. I want to pull the weeds so I can have the fruit. But pulling the weeds and juggling the fruit doesn't do anything. Abide in Christ. How do you abide in Christ? Get into his word. Have a love for him. Say, Lord, I need you to break my heart in order for me to have what you want me to have. And the one thing that he hates more than anything else is pride. And sometimes the pride is the thing that keeps us away from abiding in Christ. Because if I have pride, that means I love my sin. I love what I want. And Christ says, I know. That's why I need to prune. Because until I prune your pride, I cannot graft my vine. And once I graft the vine that produces the fruit, but until I cut the pride, I'll never have the fruit that I want you to have. Pride is saying this. My life is mine. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering is this. Lord, it's yours. See, if I could ask you a simple question, and the first question is a trick question. I like trick questions. Is Jesus really important within your life? You know, the answer would be, yeah. Jesus is really important within my life. But Jesus just being really important in your life is not good. Jesus being in charge of your life, that's where it's at. You being abiding in Christ says, Lord, I want my life to be pleasing to you. I've just given you me. Use me. Produce the fruit within my life that you want me to produce. I can bear it. I cannot produce it. Only you can produce fruit within my life. Abide in Christ.